This afternoon, it's great to be here with all of you and to see uh, so many uh, familiar uh, faces. I think uh, the Social Security Administration and, and Anna should be just uh, applauded and thrilled to have all of you together in one room. What a, what a terrific collection of, of, uh, of researchers and practitioners and government officials and uh, private sector uh, individuals. Uh, a wide range of, of folks who are here in the audience, and I, I took a look at the program uh, before coming over here, and I thought, uh, I really have misallocated my time for, uh, for the day by not, uh, by not being here with all of you uh, for the entire conference. It's um, uh, great also um, uh, to be with he you uh, here at this um, uh, critical time in our country's uh, history. When President Obama came into office a little bit more than uh, a year and a half ago, our financial markets were frozen, our economy was shrinking, and we were facing the worst economic and financial crisis our country had endured uh, since Franklin Roosevelt came into office. Our nation was losing nearly 800,000 jobs every single month. Small businesses were closing their doors, and home prices were in a free fall. President Obama moved quickly. His actions stabilized our financial markets, reduced the widespread harm brought on by the failed policies of the past, and restarted economic growth. Had he not taken such decisive action, undoubtedly the recession, as brutal as it has undoubtedly been, would have been far worse. Although the economy is now showing some signs of improvement, and many employers have begun to hire again, considerable challenges remain. Through it all, we have remained focused on the urgent obligation to fix the failures in our financial system that helped trigger the recent economic crisis and the recession, and that has cost American families and small businesses so dearly. The passage of the Dodd-Frank Act now provides a strong foundation on which we, which we must build carefully a more stable system, a system that protects consumers and investors, that rewards innovation, and it is able to adapt and evolve with changes in the financial marketplace. To be sure, the failures that led to the crisis had many causes, some here in Washington, others on Wall Street, and others on Main Street. Regulators did not protect consumers to the full extent of their authorities, <clears throat> which led to unchecked lending that was abusive and that trapped so many families. Firms and investors took on risks that they did not fully understand. And legal loopholes and regulatory gaps allowed large parts of our financial industry to operate without oversight, without transparency, and without restraint. Many Americans took on more debt than they could afford, and many firms encouraged them to do just that. And for the one in seven Americans who live in poverty, or the millions of Americans who live in fear of falling out of the middle class, these times have been particularly devastating. These families were the least prepared to handle the shock of the recession. They had little or no savings to fall back on, and stood one medical emergency or one major unexpected car malfunction away from a personal economic crisis. When the crisis hit, families found themselves over-leveraged and under-resourced. What we know is that going forward, American families will need to try to save a larger share of income and to borrow more responsibly. And today, many Americans are rediscovering the importance of living within their means. They're building assets by saving more and paying down debt. They're being more careful about how they borrow and how they invest. These changes are necessary and healthy. And ultimately, they will build economic security for American families and make our economy stronger and more resilient. The Treasury Department has been taking seriously our obligation to help bring new ideas, new models, and new frameworks to bear on solving the intractable challenges faced daily by families who are trying to build enough savings to afford a little peace of mind. We have begun several initiatives which, as part of a broader consumer protection reform, will help families save for a more secure future. Saving strategies will not solve all the problems that weigh heavily on struggling families but they will allow families to invest in their future by helping them to save for retirement, for an education, to buy a home, or to protect themselves from emergencies. 
One of the critical ways that we can help build economic security is by making consumer financial markets work better for American families. Thanks to researchers like you, we are learning more and more about the dynamics of these markets, including about financial literacy, individual psychology and behavior, and the role of financial firms as they react to these individual capabilities and psychologies. And as policymakers, we must draw on this growing body of empirical and theoretical work to design policies that improve outcomes for consumers. And as researchers, we must continue to expand this knowledge base. The evidence on consumer fallibility, for example, and on how firms behave in light of this fallibility can suggest a framework for understanding different types of mechanisms that might work well or less well in particular markets. It is for helpful, for example, to divide consumer financial markets into two broad categories. Those where firms are neutral towards or have incentives for overcoming consumer fallibility, and those where firms have incentives to exacerbate consumer biases. For example, providers of bank accounts have incentives to help individuals overcome the behavioral, some behavioral barriers to savings. Lenders, on the other hand, often have incentives to exploit biases that lead consumers to overborrow. And providers of all kinds have incentives to charge fees that are less salient for consumers or that take advantage of consumers' errors in predicting their own future product usage, such as late fees, over-the-limit fees, and overdraft fees. The implications for policymaking in each of these cases are different. It is also helpful to think about potential market interventions as falling into two kinds of categories, changing the rules of the game and changing the scoring. Changing the rules means changing what market participants must do or are allowed to do, while changing the scoring means changing the incentives, costs or benefits, of market participants to choose one practice over another. Now, interventions that change the rules and change the scoring can be useful in both types of market contexts, the scenarios where firms have incentives to overcome or to exploit consumer fallibility. However, the two scenarios may require different approaches. In the scenario where firms are neutral to or have incentives to overcome consumer biases, rule changing may be highly effective on its own. The success in promoting retirement savings through the use of smart defaults is obviously a well-known example. And in this case, employers become at worst indifferent and at best inclined to increase employee participation in defined contribution plans. In cases where firms have incentives to exacerbate biases, changing the rules may not be enough. In these cases, firms may have strong incentives to work around the rules and to render them far less effective. For example, firms may comply with the letter of disclosure laws but act to undermine them by discouraging consumers from focusing on and understanding their content. And in such cases, it may be necessary to change the way the game is scored, to change the basic incentives in the system to make a real difference for consumers. This framework has profound implications as we think about how to best promote financial access. Defaults, for example, in the defined contribution plan world serve as a prominent example of how behaviorally informed innovation can have a significant impact on the lives of everyday Americans. But there is a need for a lot more innovation that is informed by the interplay between consumer psychologies and firm incentives in market-specific contexts. Taking a step back, there are three primary ways to improve consumer financial outcomes for American families. First, enhancing individuals' financial literacy and capabilities. Second, promoting access that meets consumer needs. And third, establishing strong protections for consumers. Basic financial literacy is the necessary foundation for informed consumer decision making. But to be effective, financial literacy must be combined with improved access to suitable financial products and strong consumer protections. In essence, a new play on the old-fashioned three-legged stool. And importantly, efforts in all three areas must be driven, driven by well-considered evidence on how consumers and firms behave in the real world. Let me first turn to financial literacy. The administration has been committed to promoting strong evidence-based financial literacy efforts that help level the playing field for consumers and promote better consumer decision making. The Treasury Department in conjunction with the Financial Literacy and Education Commission is currently working on two initiatives related to financial capability. 
First, the development and implementation of a national strategy for financial literacy. And second, the dissemination of widely agreed to core financial competencies. The strategy, which was created through a process that included a broad range of stakeholders, will set strategic direction for policy, education, practice, research, and coordination in the financial literacy and education field. The development of core competencies, which is another goal of the strategy, is particularly important in establishing a baseline for financial literacy. This is crucial for both individuals and for providers of financial education. Establishing a baseline by which program success is measured will help address the current lack of consistency in financial literacy programs. And we're hoping to make these core competencies user-friendly and accessible to the public. We'll also be working closely with the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability. The President has appointed a highly qualified group of men and women from the private and nonprofit sectors to advise us on how to maximize effectiveness of existing efforts and to identify new approaches. In addition to promoting financial literacy, it is also critical to expand financial access and establish strong consumer protection. In particular, I want to talk about how behavioral insights can help inform efforts in these two areas. Research, including by many individuals in this room, has shown that consumers have predictable psychological and behavioral biases that may lead them to make suboptimal financial decisions. And financial firms can and regularly do exploit these biases, sometimes in ways that help consumers, and sometimes, and perhaps too often, in ways that harm them. The persistence of these consumer biases and a firm usage of these mistakes creates the need for mechanisms to overcome them. Now, one area where more innovation is sorely needed is in expanding access to financial services that meet the needs of low and moderate income Americans. A growing body of research has revealed that finan the financial access gap in our country is sizable. The FDIC has estimated that 9 million American households are unbanked and another 21 million are underbanked, meaning they have a checking or savings account but are not well served by these accounts and rely on costly alternative financial services. One challenge we face in expanding access to financial access, excuse me, access to financial services for low and moderate income Americans is promoting savings and the use of low-cost electronic payment mechanisms such as debit cards. Defaults or changing the rules may help in this context because the providers of savings and transactions accounts have incentives to alleviate consumer biases, for example, with respect to procrastination, in order to gather deposits. However, defaults may be less effective on their own in this market um, as they are in the retirement context because the cost to serve individuals with very small balances and low incomes can discourage firms from serving this population. In this context, a combined approach may be needed. It may be necessary to change the scoring as well as the rules, such as by designing creative solutions to help firms serve these populations with sustainable products. Treasury is taking an innovative approach to direct federal benefit payments that relate to the insights I've been discussing. Treasury is responsible, for example, for making ongoing payments to 70 million individuals for uh, direct federal benefits, including, quite importantly, Social Security payments. 15% of these individuals still receive their benefits by paper check. Individuals who have account can use direct deposit, and individuals who are unbanked or who prefer not to use direct deposit can now receive payments on something called the Direct Express Card. Direct Express is a debit card account platform offered by a bank according to requirements established by Treasury. There are now already 1.4 million federal benefit recipients who have opted into this new card, receiving benefits on Direct Express. Customers report 95% satisfaction with the card's features. When benefit recipients use Direct Deposit or the Direct Express card to receive their benefits, they enjoy the advantages of electronic payment, including enhanced safety, convenience, and control. In addition, those who might otherwise cash their benefit checks now have a more convenient way to save. They can also avoid alternative financial services fees that can take a strong toll on their benefit amounts, such as check cashing fees. Direct Express is one example of how government can make serving low and moderate income customers more sustainable for providers. In this case, the government is bundling many consumers' accounts together allowing for a more favorable scale of operation for the providers. 
Treasury is simultaneously undertaking other efforts to improve the electronic delivery of federal benefit payments. For example, Treasury is establishing rules that better protect federal benefit payments from bank account garnishment. And Treasury is enhancing requirements on the types of accounts that are eligible to receive benefit payments, including prohibiting benefits from being deposited into accounts set up for payday loan type arrangements. Now this tax season, Treasury will be starting a new pilot, a pilot to improve tax administration by offering selected low and moderate income households an opportunity to receive their tax refund, including from the earned income tax credit on a debit card. And we look forward to studying the results of this pilot to determine uh, whether to take this to a national scale. Electronic benefit payments are part of a broader set of initiative to promote financial access. One major element of these efforts is an initiative called Bank on USA. The President has requested $50 million in the next year's budget to launch a national initiative built on local Bank on movements made up of local coalitions dedicated to promoting access to financial products. Our goal is to support and enhance and improve these local efforts, as well as to promote innovation that will expand access to appropriate affordable products that better meet consumers' needs. So we need to educate consumers and we need to improve access, but we also need consumer protection. In an environment of weak and ineffective regulation, the tendency of some in the consumer financial markets to end up in races to the bottom, as we saw in the housing market, are not likely to be overcome solely by an educated consumer or improved access. The Credit Card Act, which President Obama championed and then signed into a law in May 2009, is an example of regulation written for a market and a product in which many providers had strong incentives to usher consumers into suboptimal choices, to rack up lots of late fees, and to make only the minimum payment each month. Last year, nearly 80% of American families had a credit card, and 44% of those families carried a balance on their cards. Americans were paying roughly $15 billion annually in penalty fees. The CARD Act was well-crafted legislation that combined a requirement of common sense disclosure with new protections from practices designed to make use of consumer fallibility for the benefit of the credit card issuer and, frankly, to the detriment of the consumer. For example, the Act banned unfair rate increases including rate increases on existing balances due to universal default clauses, and severely restricted retroactive rate increases due to late payment. It banned unfair fee traps, including weekend due dates or due dates that changed each month, or payment deadlines in the middle of the day. And it ended the confusing and unfair practice of so-called double cycle billing. The CARD Act also used a debiasing approach by requiring minimum balance warnings that help to inform consumers of the consequences of their actions by displaying how long it would take to pay off an existing balance if the consumer paid only the minimum payment each month and the amount the consumer would need to pay each period to pay off the balance in 36 months. Credit card companies know that the impact of compound interest on credit balances is not necessarily intuitive to most consumers. The consumer may even incorrectly assume that the credit card issuer has a primary interest in the consumer paying down the balance sooner rather than later, and therefore has set the minimum payment to an amount in line with that objective. So imagine the shock that a consumer has when he or she learns that making a minimum payment of $150 each month on a $7,000 credit card balance would take 22 years to pay off in full. Or the relief of learning on that same page that an extra $60 payment each month would reduce the time it took to pay off that balance from 22 years to three years and save more than 5,000 in interest payments along the way. That's meaningful disclosure. That's disclosure that empowers families to make choices that are right for themselves and their families. And that's what we need to do wherever we can for consumer financial products. Now the creation of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has provided us with a historic opportunity to build on a successful regulatory structure for consumer protection, one that is designed to promote financial inclusion, preserve consumer choice, and provide for more efficient and innovative markets for consumer financial products, markets that operate on a competitive basis of price and quality rather than on hidden fees. Before Dodd-Frank, our system was largely incapable of supporting a regulatory structure that would be successful for consumer protection. 
fragmentation of rule writing, supervision, and enforcement made it impossible to create a comprehensive and well-calibrated consumer regulatory regime. Jurisdiction and authority for consumer protection was spread over many federal agencies, which had higher priorities than protecting consumers. And banks could choose the least restrictive supervisor among several different banking agencies. A large number of non-bank providers escaped any meaningful supervision completely. The new Bureau will provide, for the first time, a consumer agency with mission focus, market-wide coverage, and consolidated authority. It will be an agency that focuses not simply on more regulation, but smarter, more coherent, and more effective regulation. Regulation that is designed and implemented with an understanding and respect of classical models, but is not blind to the compelling insights into consumer decisions derived from behavioral economics. Regulation that seeks to balance a consumer's ability to find the most suitable financial products from among many seemingly indistinguishable choices on the one hand, and a product provider's incentives to hide that uh, most suitable choice on the other. I have to admit what I find most curious about the voices of opposition to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, an agency I remind you whose primary principles are transparency, fairness, and access, is that their logic rests on the premise that empowering consumers is somehow antithetical to free markets. They appear to be stuck in a debate that presumes that regulation and efficient and innovative markets are at odds. In fact, the opposite is true. Markets rely on good faith and on trust and fair dealing. Markets require transparency that reflects economic reality rather than distortions caused by misleading sales pitches or hidden traps. And the discipline of the market requires clear rules. At the Treasury, we have been working hard on the creation of this new bureau. We are determining how to consolidate core authorities that are currently spread across several agencies. We are working to ensure fairness and transparency for mortgages, credit cards, and other consumer financial products. We are taking a hard look at the large non-bank providers of other consumer financial services, such as credit bureaus and debt collectors. We are planning for the provision of consumer assistance and education nationwide, including financial literacy programs, online resources, and consumer complaint hotlines. We are working to establish the offices that will protect our military families and seniors that will exist within the new Bureau. In sum, we are launching the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in order to protect and empower American families. Now, we appreciate the work that so many of you are doing to improve financial literacy and financial capability. I think together, the work in this room demonstrates that we can help work together to prevent another financial crisis, to rebuild our economy, and to do so on a stronger, more balanced foundation. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you today. You really are all amazing, and I look forward to working together with you to build a stronger America. An America where working hard and playing by the rules means security for our family and hope for our future where firms compete based on price and on quality, not on tricks or traps, where old-fashioned values of thrift are rewarded, and where once again our country is strong. Thank you very much.